I know there's been um, a request for sharing the slides on Speller, so I've done that. Um, one um, weakness in the slides I've been sharing is that the captions aren't being included. I'm struggling with Picasso. If anyone knows anything about Picasso, it can help me out. Does anyone know Picasso? I'm having trouble changing the resolution of the print. So it chokes my laptop every time I go to produce a PDF. Well, if anyone has advice for me, um, it would help out the whole class, and we'd all appreciate it. Um, there was a lot covered yesterday, and um, I debated with my fellow number fours uh, whether or not to uh, share a recording. And I think I've decided not to. So uh, I want to uh, encourage you to be active in class, taking notes, asking the questions, how do these things do what uh, I'm claiming they do, and demanding of me that I show you. Um, no one has yet asked me to explain what I mean by Missouri rules. Um, uh, I'm waiting for someone to uh, interrupt me during the lecture and say, what do you mean by Missouri rules? Um, uh, but I'll just tell you. Um, in Missouri, who's been to Missouri? Who's from Missouri? Who knows what it, up until recently, it said on the Missouri license plate? Show me state. The show me state. How did you know that? <laughs> so famously, a senator from Missouri said uh, in Congress, um, you can offer us all these fancy words all you want, but I'm from Missouri. You have to show me. I'm not going to be convinced by your blah, blah, blah. And that's uh, a colloquial way of expressing the standards of history and of scholarship and of science, um, to bring it closer to your concerns uh, here at MIT, uh, you pretty much, one way to, to uh, explain the ethics and the standards of science, you can't say anything that you don't show. You have to show first, and then you can say it. You earn the right to say something once you've shown it to us. And so that's why it's not tell and show when you're in kindergarten. It is show and tell. And it's show and tell all the way through your uh, multi-million dollar research grants. It is show and tell. Um, don't just tell me, you got to show me. And so that's kind of at the core of these presentations, I'm trying to live by Missouri rules. I'm trying to exemplify Missouri rules. I'm asking you to live by Missouri rules uh, with every weekly assignment uh, and with every quiz and with your term project. More coming uh, between now and next Monday on the term project. We'll uh, set you up with the step-by-step -step procedure for that. But it's basically an expanded a deeper, heavier version of your weekly assignments. So uh, by the time you've done, by the time you've, you get to the point of, of really focusing in on the term project, you will have already done it several times, uh, many versions of it. And so this is really the focus of work in your recitation meetings with your TAs is how do you do this work of history? How do you do history effectively? Rule number one, don't say anything that you're not showing. So show the visual analysis, the burden of proof lies in the visual analysis. Give us the evidence and then articulate what that evidence is showing you. This is not a report of stuff you've read. This is a demonstration of stuff you've discovered. Um, and um, as are my lectures. Um, I've read a lot, but um, what I'm trying to present are things that we collectively have discovered. And part of that collective are 
the students who I've taught who've helped me understand these examples. Sometimes you'll see uh, visual evidence on the screen that were produced by um, your colleagues who came before you. Um, so let me fix the lighting. Any questions about that? Okay. So we start um, <clears throat> today uh, with another big heavy lecture of a very deep pool of material. Um, just like yesterday when we started with one of the paradigmatic structures of the 20th century, uh, today we start with another one. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House, which is the pinnacle of, like Villa Savoie for Corbusier, the Roby House uh, is the generally accepted pinnacle of Frank Lloyd Wright's prairie school uh, residential designs uh, that he was working on as a young architect uh, from the 1890s through to about 1910 when there was an abrupt interruption in his career uh, when he stole off with a client's wife and absconded to Europe. Um, quite colorful biographical material if you like uh, public television. Um, so on your lecture sheet, and I should grab one of those, uh, it has uh, the 20 top reasons we love Wright's Prairie style houses. So here we are, uh, spelled out for your um, for your active engagement, features, um, actual aspects, architectural aspects, specific aspects of the building that are available to you uh, for responding on, let's say, for example, hypothetically, if you should encounter a question on a quiz saying, um, show, how, show how two specific aspects of Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House uh, does something, demonstrates something. And in this case, in this lecture, just to give you a, a larger narrative, we're looking at the American landscape, the North American landscape, and how uh, the events of history uh, with a very prominent role played by architecture, small a architecture, with which we mean not just star architect buildings, capital A architecture, but also small a architecture, which we return to the historically respected definition of architecture, which extends beyond um, avant-garde masterpieces of uh, a few great men, um, and most recent, and then recently a few handful of great women. Um, so we, we we're going beyond that and talking about the landscape as an active agent or an instrument. Uh, I want to stay away from non-sentient elements as being giving them agency, but they are active instruments. They are both reflections of the values and conditions of history, but also instruments of active agents of history. And so uh, we start with Roby House. Um, we can look at uh, some of the elements. Uh, you, you can almost treat this as a checklist, a scorecard going through the lecture. Um, we're going to be explicit about it in this lecture, but hopefully throughout this term uh, you can uh, produce lists of this sort uh, of the specific aspects of the buildings and of the examples and of the sites that exemplify especially because that's the big one we're most interested in is exemplification um, of specific aspects and how they play a role in history. And so here we go. Uh, the Roby House uh, as designed um, was very much intending like the other prairie style Prairie School architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, to use plantings uh, in a decorative manner to embellish and to bring it into the landscape. Again, uh, with apologies to Elvis, uh, the architecture has left the building. Um, architecture doesn't stop where the air conditioning stops. It keeps going and extends into the landscape, and very much so in the prairie style. It merges like H.H. Uh, H. Richardson, who uh, was a uh, precedent that was very powerful in Frank Lloyd Wright's career. H.H. H. Richardson, uh, the Trinity Church in Boston, 
then uh, Sullivan, Lewis Sullivan, and then Frank Lloyd Wright. In succession, they came through each other's offices, and so there's a very strong connection there that we don't have time to get into. Um, the connection with the landscape is a fundamental principle. Uh, the landscape, uh, this is the last moment when you can still get the sense in Chicago that you're part of the Midwestern prairie. We'll talk more about Chicago in the future, I suspect. Um, but the, the horizontal lines of this uh, architecture uh, is meant to uh, resonate with the horizon line that is the dominant geometry of the landscape. And so the connection between the house form and the landscape is fundamental to this. And it's not just the overarching form of the building, but it comes down to the details. And this is one of the most luscious things about uh, this building and his other work, is the power with which these large formal themes permeate right down through the details. Um, and some more of these details, you see the very uh, ceiling height in section. So here's one of the uh, useful aspects of a section drawing is you get to project yourself into the, the space mentally and see what it's like to be in there with the, with the ceiling, the coffered ceiling that kind of hugs and embraces you. The massive hearth at the center of the prairie uh, homes, uh, the open plan, the, uh, the, it's not perfectly symmetrical. It's kind of a dynamic balance, which harkens back to the very strong, we keep, I keep mentioning the uh, connection between uh, painting at this time, uh, but this abstract balance of uh, what some painters call the fourth dimension, a mystical concept of, of balance that somehow God was speaking to these painters. But there is something uh, intuitively uh, right about the compositional form, the dynamic balance of the plan and the section. Uh, these horizontal lines uh, all intersect at the one vertical element at the center of the composition, which is the hearth the hearth at the center of the, the American family structure. Um, the windows, uh, and we, this refers back to uh, Corbusier's uh, five points. Corbusier uh, had his free facade and his ribbon window. Frank Lloyd Wright has his screen where one reading is these are punched openings in a wall, but not quite. It's more... The, uh, these column elements are separating the windows. At what point uh, does the punched opening in the plane of the wall dissolve into something that is more like uh, Corbusier's ribbon window? This is suspended somewhere in between, and it really is a distinct compositional approach, distinct from the punched opening and distinct from uh, the ribbon window. Um, uh, you can see uh, this kind of pinwheel dynamic plan uh, reaching up into the second floor. Um, the servants' quarters, again, like the Villa Savoie, it's an interesting comparison that we might bring in uh, for the midterm exam between these two houses. Um, and it goes on and on with the down the list of the 20 things. Um, in a longer version, in a more stretched out version, of this course where we focus more on the 20th century, we would go through one by one uh, each of our top 20 favorite things. We don't have the luxury of that, so we're just skimming over the surface of some of our favorites and leaving it to you and your active engagement in the course to um, fill in the blanks. But this uh, idea of equipment, which is really a European term that we don't use uh, here in North America, but the um, in the Span Latin speaking world, equipment is very much a part of the design. And it's useful here to talk about the equipment of the home, the built in furniture, the light fixtures integrated into the architecture, the uh, custom furniture designed for this space in the tradition of the arts and crafts and Art Nouveau movements of. Uh, Henri van der Velde's Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work of art. Um, and so very much building on that tradition uh, in this interior. Uh, the embrace of the space of the ceiling, the uh, centrality of the hearth, 
um, that you can see there on the left. Um, the stained glass in the living room, which was um, one of Frank Lloyd Wright's celebrated um, contributions. Uh, the integration of this light fixture is really uh, these motifs are extensions of the structural logic of the house. So these horizontal elements are, are broken down. At, or they start at a grand scale of the whole house with the cantilevered lead, uh, eaves and the uh, strong horizontal lines, which is part of the mm -hmm. structural logic of the house. And it's extended here into the uh, decorative motifs, right down to the mortar joints. And so the same logic that informs the overarching form of the, of the prairie schoolhouses uh, is down in the details. The vertical mortar joints are a dark colored mortar, and the horizontal mortar joints are a light color. And so the use of Roman brick, which is more horizontal than the standard, uh, the standard brick of the industrial era, uh, so these are long and thin, horizontal, expressive, and then just to push that a little bit further, he takes the extraordinary uh, measures uh, at great expense to vary the color of the mortar to emphasize that horizontal uh, motif right down to the details. Um, there's a Japanese concept of ediburi, which comes out of the study of nature, uh, especially trees and the, the logic of branching. Uh, which resonates with these other themes that we're talking about, where the large idea of the tree is expressed in the small details of the branches and twigs and leaves. And we see that in uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, where the larger uh, logic of the building is expressed every opportunity, uh, where Frank Lloyd Wright, whenever he's designing something, uh, he starts with the question, how can I express the larger idea now in this detail or in that detail. And it results in a very exquisite um, outcome of resonating messages. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright suffered a great deal of ridicule in North America for being, uh, as Corbusier put it, the, one, of the great, uh, one of the greatest 19th century architects, which was uh, a put down. Um, but, uh, and he had varying fortunes in North America. He was out and he was in. You saw him included in Philip Johnson's international style exhibition in 1932. But in a way, um, and one more thing that in the, in the course of his career, he was constantly inventing things that became uh, standard aspects of American single family housing, the attached garage. Um, uh, all kinds of details that we take for granted in post-war uh, domestic architecture are innovations that Frank Lloyd Wright came up with. Uh, but still, he uh, was not well appreciated in the United States compared with the impact he had in Europe. And in Europe, uh, in 1910, one of the reasons he took off to Europe was because he had a very wealthy um, fan base who, uh, one of whom was Ernst Wasmuth, who published in 1910 this portfolio of Frank Lloyd Wright's earlier work, and um, which had a huge impact on multiple uh, practices in different ways. It's interesting how this planted the seed that took root and sprouted into multiple different uh, forms coming out of that spark of inspiration. We see here the special edition of the Journal of Endingen um, in 1925 and a Dutch uh, uh, exhibition in 1931. The Dutch in particular uh, latched on to uh, the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, it was influential in the establishment of what has come to be known as the Amsterdam School uh, it really uh, owes a great deal to the arts and crafts movement of the honest expression of materiality here in brick, uh, and is seen most famously in the the, the wonderful uh, housing uh, and urban extension uh, in the South Amsterdam project of Berlach. Um, we see other elements here as early as 1916, 
where very clearly that screen motif of the prairie style is here uh, emulated. Um, and you see it uh, in plan. You can read it. And here's an example of things you can read in plan that you can't access any other way. You have the smaller programmatic spaces of, I imagine, bathrooms, the kitchen, the closet, the butler's pantry, all of these elements that tend to uh, be mass, masses of more or less enclosed spaces gathered at the rear of the house, and then this open screen on either side, wherever we can avoid the punctured opening, uh, we do that in the front. And by we, I mean Rob Vantov. Um, and the number one thing on the list of 20 things is the exploding of the box. And this is what Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, my favorite thing about what he's done, and it seems to be the thing that took off most uh, in Europe, uh, is this exploding of the box. And no more, uh, nowhere more forcefully and clearly than in the work of Garrett Rittfeld, who was a sculptor, his famous red blue chair of 1917. And the one piece of architecture he, he built, I believe, uh, the 1923 Schroeder House in Utrecht. And um, this is pronounced de style, I believe, right? De style. We in the United States like to say de style, so it doesn't sound like we're mispronouncing it by saying the style. But it's actually de style in Dutch. So um, forgive your friends when they say de style. Um, but the axonometric as a crucial tool of uh, developing this spatial experience of the exploding box. There are no corners. The corners are suppressed. This is a composition of planes. And the concept of de style is that I give you a plane. I express it as a plane by coloring one surface, uh, that color, and I don't let that color wrap around the corner. That way, you are clear, right? try to avoid, or I'm careful. Sometimes I wrap the color around the corner, read that as a mass. Sometimes I keep the color isolated to one surface. Read that as a plane that your mind, your brain, naturally extends it in space. And so this is uh, a composition of planes that extend in space beyond the building itself. And the original conception of this architecture is that other buildings around um, wasn't true at this moment, but the idea was other architecture uh, would echo and resonate with this, this spatial expression, and it would create a, a larger field of multiple planes, of planar expressions. It was a vision of a new spatial experience for a new chapter in human development. Um, Nothing modest about it. It was a uh, heady, glorious, heroic, early modernist uh, ex uh, ambitions. And here we see the, the virtual planes uh, exploding in space mm -hmm. were complemented by the actual moving planes of partitions and doorways. Uh, and the suppression of the corner becomes one of the paradigmatic moves of the modern movement where uh, the spatial expression uh, is liberated from the structural requirement of catching those vertical forces, you know, gravity, that concentrate at corners. And we'll see as we move into Roman and Greece architecture how important it is to express that greater force at the corner just aesthetically so it looks right. This flips that on its head and says we are no longer bound to the surface of the planet. We are heading into a gravity-free future of glorious things. Um, and so we see the apotheosis of this and Theo, Theo van Dosberg, uh, especially in his collaborations with Cornelis um, van Esteren, uh, in these counter-constructions where the relationship between uh, these floating planes in space are immediately translated into the architectural expression and the potential for architecture as a composition of floating planes in space 
um, that now suddenly becomes available as uh, uh, through the the technologies of glass and steel. Um, now, he, checking back in with Frank Lloyd Wright back in the United States, he uh, over the decades he uh, starts to speculate on the American landscape and the implications for his prairie style exploded boxes uh, filling out the landscape. Uh, and, and it starts here to putting these four prairie style, actually you, at this point he's calling them Usonian, which is a play on the U.S. Um, so it's a Usonian architecture coming out of the prairie school and taking the pinwheel logic of the plan and extending it into a cluster of houses around these four quadrants and then extending that further um, here we're jumping to a 1942 project of, of wartime housing um, in Pittsfield, uh, Massachusetts. But this idea of how this logic of the pinwheel plan of the house can be extended to the larger landscape. And then most famously in his 1935 Broadacre City proposal, where the future will be of flying machines, uh, of cars, high-speed roadways, and uh, the spreading out of humans across the North American continent. Uh, it's a, an architectural version of rural electrification uh, where the go U.S. government takes responsibility for making sure everyone, no matter how remotely they live, everybody gets electricity. And we don't charge uh, more for someone who's costing us a lot of money to give them electricity. We charge everyone the same amount. We do the same thing with the Postal Service, uh, back when we believed in such things, and roads. And so we, we cover the continent with roads. Uh, we'll get to the Jeffersonian grid, which was part of that logic of conquest. But Frank Lloyd Wright continues that spirit of taking command of North America uh, in this low density vision uh, dominated by um, a few point towers in the landscape um, but connected in this grid of roadways and every home gets one acre of land where people grow their own food and he built a 12 foot by 12 foot model uh, quite a dramatic uh, demonstration of these ideas of very low density Spread, maximum spreading out across the continent. Which brings us to 1939 World's Fair. General Motors uh, sponsors the industrial designer um, Norman Bel Geddes, his work to show in ads in Life magazine what the city of the future, what the landscape of North America in the future will look like. And this was the highlight of one of the great events, one of the great World's Fairs of the 20th century, 1939 in New York. Um, the lines were, as you can see, around the block. Um, this was, uh, this is Norman Bel Geddes uh, building the model that is a vast model, like Broadac bigger than Broadacre City, um, that shows the city, uh, New York City, and its region in 1960. And you view it from this, uh, these seats on a rail track that goes around the model and moves very slowly as if you're in an airplane. And the stunning thing is that his vision is remarked. Either he uh, is clairvoyant or like the flip phone that started with Star Trek, the, mod, the way the world plays out was influenced by his vision in 1939. And uh, it is quite um, reasonable uh, that this is not that different from what the world has become. The, uh, the, the fair itself uh, was one of the most visited events in history and it had a huge influence on what people then took for granted as the future of North America and as we see uh, in the next few examples increasingly the world. Upon leaving the space of the model uh, 
uh, visitors were confronted with this landscape, again, like the pictures we saw yesterday, of the elevated walkways for pedestrians. Uh, the ground plane is given over to automobile traffic. Uh, people were handed a button that said, I have seen the future. Uh, and it is a future of automobiles as the universal means of conveyance. As Corbusier had predicted uh, in his separation of the four functions uh, through the work of Siam, C-I-A-M, and the Manifesto of Siam, the Athens Charter of 1933, in the post-World War era of Reconstruction, that is the blueprint of the world that came to pass. Since the Futurama, not everyone in the United States could visit the Futurama, uh, they put it on the, on the road. And we have the parade of progress um, before and after World War II to bring that vision of the future to cities across North America. And um, the children uh, grow up believing that this is what the future holds, and sure enough, it does. And the biggest way this came into being is through the work of Robert Moses, who became the most powerful unelected uh, official of uh, first New York City and then increasingly New York State. When you think of New York as the empire state, and the, this, this was the man who made it into an empire. This is him. You notice in the map in the background, New York City prior to the freeway system. Uh, and you see the, the World's Fair grounds in Queens um, near LaGuardia Airport. And, um, and he subsequently uh, is at the core of transforming uh, the landscape of the New York City region. Um, Eisenhower, as part of an early military uh, test, took a convoy of military vehicles from the East Coast to the West Coast just to see how long it would take to deploy military vehicles across the continent uh, in case of war. And it took them famously um, a very, very long time, which became the primary reason and excuse for passing the Interstate Highway Act um, that complemented another post-war uh, move, which was the, uh, the housing, the Federal Housing Authority uh, subsidies uh, for mortgage and the tax benefits of mortgages. So together, this new highway in infrastructure, the new mortgage lending practices, the tax arrangements in uh, unique to North America, uh, for the most part, fortunately, uh, that you can secede from the urban center and keep your tax money in the wealthy suburbs and thus have good schools such that anyone who could afford to leave the city would. You can uh, borrow money on very favorable terms, move out of the city, and live outside the city in beautiful new housing for less than the cost of renting. And anyone could do this, as long as you were white. Uh, and it was a very dark moment in history of white flight, racial segregation, um, that we're not going to get into, but it was complemented by the slum clearance efforts that were a, a very um, well-favored way to supposedly improve the conditions of the poor. Uh, so this is linking back to what we have seen in Medellin, in Previ, in Lima, Peru. Um, uh, it really comes from the developmentalist idea that to s help people make progress you destroy their housing and give them better housing. Uh, but the link between those two moments in history, between destroying people's housing and giving them better housing, doesn't always work. Um, sometimes it does. Uh, Co-op City in, in the Bronx uh, worked remarkably well. But even when it works, it sucked life out of the Bronx, and you have the famous decay of the Bronx in the 70s and 80s. Um, but this is a story that's probably fairly well understood because the landscape around us all every day is the product of this thinking of uh, demolition and reconstruction. We saw it uh, in this neighborhood in our very first topic of the course uh, at MIT. 
And so we see um, this imprint on the landscape. Uh, here's Kennedy with Moses behind him overlooking the proposal for the 1965 World's Fair. Uh, and here we see Robert Moses later in his career proudly uh, standing in front of the city. He has transformed uh, the UN uh, off to his right, your left. Uh, the 1963 demolition of McKim, Mead, and White's Penn Station was part of this and caused a dramatic backlash and uh, is credited with launching the historic preservation movement in North America. Um, let's get into the logic of space uh, that comes into this. Um, we think of Amsterdam as this wonderful place that has always been cute and human scaled. Right, Rix? It's so lovely. And it was always this way, right? Well, in the 70s, there really wasn't much of a difference between what was happening in New York City with the demolitions and the clearances and the road widenings and what was happening in Amsterdam. The difference was what people did about it. And this is um, a Missouri Rules demonstration that they used in 1970. I don't think they called it that. I'm sure they didn't call it that. But here we go. This was the visualization that was deployed to change people's minds about the decimation of Amsterdam. And so here's the space required to move 40 people if they go in cars. Now the cars themselves are a majority of that space. And if you pull them out of their seats, they take up even less space. And you can just put them on bicycles and then move them into line. And that's what Amsterdam looks like today, is people on bicycles. They're insane. They don't care that it's wet and cold. They just ride bicycles. And they don't wear lycra. I don't get it. They don't even wear helmets. And they're so friendly. Unless you walk in the bike lane. Don't walk in the bike lane. Walk on the sidewalk. And that's what it looks like when those 40 people are walking on the sidewalk. Look at all that extra space. Amazing. And these 40 people can even vacate the sidewalk, go on a bus. That's how much space they take up. So the spatial logic of the automobile uh, lends itself to an architectural analysis. These are the, this is the formal spatial arrangement. This is an analysis of the formal spatial arrangement of the architecture of what I call Mies on wheels, the glass and steel box of Mies van der Rohe's architecture. You put it, add some rubber wheels, and you have the car. Uh, and it takes up a huge amount of space compared to the alternatives. And it has implications, which have been studied. Um, and the logic of this is well known. And right from the very beginning, the first uh, limited access highway in North America, uh, from Pasadena to LA, uh, the engineer noted that, hey, we thought this was going to free up uh, road space when we built this toll road. Um, but look what happened. Within the first six months to six to 12 months, it filled up. What's going on here? It's almost as if you give more space for cars. If you build it, they will come and fill it up. Crazy. Well, every few weeks, you will see in the newspaper, uh, as if it's a new discovery, hey, if we widen the roads, we'll just have the same congestion, just more debt to pay for the road widening. Let's skip that. And it's almost, it keeps being rediscovered every few years. But we knew it from the first moment we built the first road. Um, the logic that uh, was developed in the United States was um, under the title Urban Transportation Planning uh, was a Trojan horse. And we trained planners for several uh, decades in the post-war period to plan transportation for cities around a single mode of transportation the private automobile. And compared to the rest of the world, as bad as it is on days like today in Boston, it actually works miraculously well. So I don't want to take anything away from the miracle that is the automobile landscape of North America. Um, it's the worst possible thing, except for all the other possibilities. It's like democracy in that way. But uh, to the extent that it uh, works more or less in North America it has proven disastrous as the rest of the world has taken it on 
the logic is predict the needs and provide. It's a predict and provide model of transportation planning. And um, here, when traffic gets congested, you build more roads. And when there's not enough parking, you build more parking. And so following that logic, uh, you would think that it would, it would strike a balance and everything would be cool. Well, here we see Houston with 85% of the ground area of downtown devoted to the automobile and 15% to humans outside of their automobile. And still, it's one of the most uh, difficult traffic situations in the country. So at what point do you strike the right balance? Is it 90-10? Is it 95-5? Or is this tyranny of uh, induced demand for road space something that you just can't build your way out of? Yes. Well, um, I think we'll see the answer to that in the final example. Um, but it's a, it's should be seen. Uh, it it's presented as a technical necessity, uh, and places like MIT were at the forefront of this. But um, more recently, and actually not so recently, Ralph Gackenheimer, uh, just over there, I saw him yesterday. Um, is emeritus. Uh, he is one of the foremost critics of this approach, pointing out in his writings, along with Harry D Dimitriou, uh, the, uh, the technical backwardness of this approach, that we know everything we need to know about the problems with this, as so clearly demonstrated in the Dutch uh, Missouri Rules demonstration. Uh, we don't, this is not a mystery. It doesn't need more research. We know the answer. The reason we keep doing it, as your example in Myanmar so clearly exemplifies, and this would be a good thing to look at in a weekly assignment, maybe even a term project, is that this is a cultural move. We know what success looks like. And we're going to get to one of those slides where I talk about how we know when someone is a winner and how we know when someone is a loser. Um, this is the architectural equivalent of the Dutch photo uh, visualization, where this is a typical retail space where you, you want to fill the lot with uh, as much store as you can. But then uh, zoning laws come in and they say, well, you got to have parking for your customers. And so you got to skimp. you got to sacrifice some of that retail space, half of it in this example, for cars for 17 uh, customers and employees. But that's not really enough because the parking lot uh, is always full. So the logic just continues. And that's how you get a situation like Houston, where uh, you can't park close enough. You need, you need to have a, a little mini Cooper hanging off the back of your uh, SUV so you can get from the parking space uh, to your office, or maybe a Segway, or maybe a bicycle. And so this has become a very common spatial experience in North America and increasingly the world. Which brings us to Las Vegas. In 1966, uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, along with their TA, uh, Stephen Eisenor, famously took a group of 13 students to visit Las Vegas to see what's going on there. Totally off the reservation. You are so not allowed to do that if you are, want to be a respected faculty member at Yale. Or was it Penn? Yale. Um, and so they go there and they find something like this. Just, well, this is a more recent photo. But architecture deployed for the purposes of not uh, human progress into the future, but for the purpose of selling uh, and creating spectacle and experience. And you can see the, the Las Vegas Strip. Um, it starts here and expands this way and keeps going and is still going strong. 
Um, Las Vegas was the fastest growing city in North America for most of the 90s and, and then some. Um, they published their experiences in learning from Las Vegas uh, and it is based on the analysis using architectural methods uh, deployed uh, in on, a, on a site that does not usually gain the attention of architects and thus he becomes very much, they become very much part of the greys, not the whites. The whites rejected this whole thing. The greys, the people who were suspect because they weren't uh, focused on the formal extension of the logic of Corbusier. And so they're looking at the actual uh, formal spatial arrangements and how people experience these, this landscape along the, the strip. And they're comparing it to uh, paradigmatic examples that we will study in this course. Um, the strip with this signage, this architecture of signage, uh, which is a, somehow a hybrid between a main street and the experience of the highway where at each exit you see a sign that tells you what brand of gasoline and what brand of hamburger is being sold at that exit. Uh, and then it's compared with the Ville Radius that we studied yesterday, Broad Acre City that we were just looking at a few moments ago, and onward to other things we will look at in this course. Um, and so uh, the extension of the strip continues. Who's been there? I love Las Vegas, I have to say. But it is evil. Um, so um, the uh, the primary experience commented on uh, by Venturi and team uh, was the signage as architecture, and it's not just planes with letters on them, but it's the letter forms themselves in a dramatic demonstration of architectural denotation. It's not just imprinted on the facade like we saw at MIT where it says Newton. It is the form itself, are the letters. Uh, and there's been a lot of research on that lately. This brings us to the duck. Um, so the two uh, categories of building that Venturi and Scott Brown uh, identify is the duck and the decorated shed. And so you, the duck is, he uses this example, but they encountered on Long Island, where the architectural form is the message. So you're supposed to look at the form and get any meaning you, you want uh, from the form of the building. I suppose that's reproduction of the duck mm -hmm. with difference uh, in that it's a building. Um, and then this one is a much more common thing, and uh, they... Uh, presented as being more common in human history uh, that the decorated shed, where the building is the, whatever the building must be because of the limitations of masonry construction or whatever system, and then it's simply decorated in a way that indicates that this is a bank or a church or a home, etc., or a factory. Um, and that the important thing is the message of the decorative elements of the architecture that are imposed on the outside. And that message can actually change even if the building stays exactly the same. And so we have the duck versus the decorated shed. And um, they go on in a fairly thorough manner to look at the different examples, the different casino hotels uh, uh, on this axis, and then the comparing the different elements and how architectural meanings are constructed uh, and conveyed uh, in this context. Um, and so the primary experience is at high speed. The reason the signage has to be the way it is is because we're not walking and looking to our sides at a slow speed. We're traveling at high speed, and so the signs are competing with each other to grab our attention, to get us to stop, to say, oh, wow, and that's the whole point of the signage. And um, in a more recent uh, manifestation of this approach, uh, the traffic has slowed down a bit. Um, the common form of a casino is the air-conditioned big box, no windows. The bigger, the better. The question is how many slot machines and how how can you fit per square foot? And because every one of those is a, 
a source of money. It's like a magic golden bush. You plant a slot machine there and it makes money. It just brings you money. So maximize. So this architecture is a machine at its core for maximizing the number of orifices into which people can throw their money. On top of that, you've got to get people into that big box, air-conditioned big box of money-making orifices. And uh, you do that by putting big ducts on top of it. Uh, hotel rooms tend to have windows, but now you need to deploy hotel room towers that dramatically refer to something else that reproduce with a difference. Sometimes it's a big duct like the Eiffel Tower or a hot air balloon or the fountains of the Bellagio or the pyramid of the Luxor. Um, the more fantastic, the better. And so here we see the, the Eiffel Tower and the Bellagio. The Bellagio is one of the few places that breaks that, and they actually put windows in the gaming halls uh, because it's also a, a shopping mall. Um, and so the logic of Las Vegas is a, has been well studied, and it combines the architecture of casino resorts with the architecture of the automobile and the experience of the landscape at speed. And, um, and so it's something that we can really look at when we go on and look at things like Los Angeles and uh, the social conditions that are implied by this. So uh, this study famously looks at the impact of traffic on the social lives of people who live on a street. So two streets next to each other, one has heavier traffic above and one has lighter traffic. The heavier the automobile traffic, the lighter the human uh, body traffic, pedestrian traffic, and thus the lower the social connection uh, uh, between neighbors on that street. Whereas below, with the lighter traffic, children tend to occupy these spaces. Again, repeating something we talked about yesterday. The children are the indicator species, and they are the key to the social life of the parents and the families um, with relationships that continue. So how do you tell who's a winner and who's a loser? These people are winners. And uh, the way this image is set up, it, it checks all the boxes. Losers wait for the bus in the slush that may or may not ever come because of the bankruptcy of the MBTA. Which leads to um, social segregation. So very quickly, because I'm running long, um, very closely related to Las Vegas is Los Angeles. They're actually part of the same ecosystem the freeway between Las Vegas and Los Angeles uh, for many years was the primary conduit by which people with their coins uh, made it to those orifices in the, in the gaming halls. Um, some of the implications of automobility, and I use the word automobility to not refer just to the car, because cars themselves are a very small part of the larger system. It's the car plus the road infrastructure that we very successfully and proudly developed in North America to the envy of the rest of the world and now the emulation of the rest of the world to the relationship between roads and the architecture along those roads as we see in Las Vegas. And not just that, that structure, that physical arrangement is, corresponds with a social condition where uh, when we want to go to church, we get in the car. When we need a loaf of bread, we get in the car. When we go visit friends, we get in the car. We tend not to run into people. Pre-computer uh, in my pocket, I didn't have a lot of, I, a typical American, did not have a big social life outside of making arrangements ahead of time to go visit. Uh, and so there's this social isolation and the uh, removal of serendipity from human experience. And so people um, it connected with that, and without going uh, into the details of how this happens, there is a social segregation, and which, of course, in uh, the late 20th, early 21st century, 
still is part of a racial ethnic segregation. And so we have uh, South Central um, Los Angeles, where um, a significant, embarrassingly large proportion of the um, black male population ends up dead or in jail. Um, and the white populations hugging the coasts, uh, Pasadena, the mountains, the valley, and the Hispanic population um, filling in between those two. Uh, now, a very strange thing happens with cars, something nobody expected. Your generation is weird. This is tough to follow, so I'm, and we don't have time, so I'm going to jump to this one. This is the amount of driving, uh, and we expected it to keep going until resource warfare and peak oil um, somehow brought it to an end, uh, or a zombie apocalypse or something. But even without a zombie apocalypse, uh, and even now with gas prices being stupidly low, uh, your generation, which is increasingly uh, a large proportion of the U.S. population, doesn't drive so much. Go figure. And it seems unrelated with gas prices. And walkability has become the new cool. Being able to walk to an internet cafe is the new fill-in-the-blank uh, Trans Am macho car. It's the new source of cool. How small is my computer? How uh, fast and functional is my phone? Not how big is my car? Not how muscle-bound is my car? Or how loud is my car? So the social, there's a technical aspect to this, but uh, what the evidence that I'm trying to uh, pull together here shows that it's not just technical. It is very much cultural, social, and uh, perceptions of power, class, it's, it's all integrated, it's all intertwined, and it drives everything, which brings us again to China. <clears throat> um, the forms of buildings that have been favored of late, especially in China, until the current president who said no more weird buildings, that was his, one of his first presidential decrees, very interestingly enough, said no more weird buildings, he seems to acknowledge that, yes, this is the largest property bubble ever seen in human history. And when it pops, it will make the 2008 thing seem like child's play. So here we are uh, filling the landscape of China with Las Vegas ducks. The, build, the shape of the building is intended to say, hey, look at me on ring road number three as you whiz by. Notice me. I'm not the tallest building in the world. Uh, instead of making the tallest building, Rem Kohlhaas has famously, Dutch Rem Kohlhaas has famously said, no, it's not going to be a skyscraper. You know, any, any Middle Eastern SOM can do that. We're going for uh, freakish acrobatics of structural prowess, and we're going to express the structural strategies on the facade. That's how central it is. So the, here, once again, you have the technical uh, miracle of structural engineering of the space frame uh, expressed on the out, outer skin, which is what Stephen Hall uh, did with his paint colors in the dorm over here, the sponge building. Uh, but Rem Kohlhaas is saying, I, I see your, your colored structural grid, and I raise you uh, highly expressive cultural space frame uh, diagrid on the exterior. And even though I'm proudly saying this isn't the tallest building in the world, it's pretty damn tall. Uh, <clears throat> and there it is on ring road number three uh, in the smoggy, I think this is high noon, no, I'm not sure what time of day this is, but um, uh, the remarkable achievement that is this building uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, it really is a tremendous uh, accomplishment, but methinks thou dost 
try too hard. Um, but that's what China has been doing, and we're going to look at in weeks to come why it is so important for China. Uh, and I'm actually uh, right at the top of the fans of this. China needs to break from the developmentalist, which is the title of this lecture, sequence, the teleological assumption that uh, things like the International Monetary Fund and the other institutions and uh, agents of the Washington Consensus seem to believe in their heart of hearts, sincerely, with all the best of intentions, that every nation in the world, and we always talk about nations for some reason, uh, that we'll look at in next week, that every nation in the world needs to take baby steps and move up that evolutionary ladder from less developed to more developed. It's there in the language. We don't say third world and first world anymore, but we say less developed and more developed, and now we say emerging economies. You must emerge baby step-wise. And that's how we, uh, coincidentally, at Davos and elsewhere, maintain our supremacy as the top economy in the world. Well, Singapore said, hey, we can't afford to take baby steps and follow in that trajectory. We will always be at the bottom. So they took the bold move of leapfrogging and doing, taking everything the West had done and doing it better and bigger and, and more successfully. China is doing the same thing. It is, uh, it's just really big, and it's hard to do. Even with total tyrannical control over everything, it's difficult to do. Um, but it needs to do it for multiple reasons, um, a lot of which have to do with the pride of the culture. Uh, and we'll look at why. So this is an extremely complex building. Here's the obligatory ball of flame uh, that seems to show up in every project I present. Um, it delayed the, uh, delayed the opening of the building somewhat. We are able to look down from above and uh, look up from below and see this on the skyline. Uh, here, again, the photography of Iwan Ban, uh, who uh, breaks all the rules and puts human beings in his architectural pictures. And this is the Las Vegas uh, signage architecture duck experience of so many of the weird buildings of China and everywhere else in the world, many of which we've been looking at in the past few weeks. Hopefully we'll get a break from that theme um, soon. But um, this is part of the larger effort. We talked about the Interstate Highway Act uh, for military purposes of North America. Here is the international equivalent of the uh, Interstate Highway um, Plan for Asia. Uh, because, of course, in the developmentalist idea, uh, we need to uh, extend that wonderful luxury that we universally enjoy in the United States. Everyone drives, except for old people, children, and poor people. But everyone drives in the United States. Uh, the automobile population uh, peaked very close to 800 cars per 1,000 people. It's now going down. Uh, China... Um, even though there are some remarkable ring road constructions, I think the black is Beijing ring road, if you compare all the ring roads uh, mm -hmm. around the world. Um, China has a tiny percentage of its population with cars compared to North America, but it is growing faster than any other place. China has emission control standards that far exceed what we've ever seen in North America. But because so many people are driving, uh, the increase in drivers in, in China means that even with great emission standards, the pollution uh, from cars is really off the charts. And here we see um, the Hans Rosling visualization of the income per capita uh, uh, as a time graph. Here's India in blue, here's China, zooming forward. Uh, and so this is the visualization that shows that um, all bets are off in terms of the developmentalist sequence of progress of these nations. Coal-fired 
power plants. The urbanization and the pollution of China really is uh, the big story when it comes to what is going to happen to the planet. Here we see Al Gore with his famous forklift <clears throat> uh, visualization uh, from Convenient Truth. The relocation of people in the urbanization, the mismatch between what people need and the housing that people are given in this urbanization thing. Uh, the apartments all have washing, washing machines, but the electrical bills are too much for people to use, so they still wash clothes in the nearby drainage ditch. Um, uh, images like this, uh, I have thousands of them at this point. Uh, I'm not going to show you pictures of the ghost cities of China. Have you seen those? They're really big on Facebook and YouTube and vast cities for uh, populations of hundreds of thousands of people where no one is there. They were built uh, and hoping that they would come. Nine new towns outside of Shanghai uh, developed in the reproduce with difference. This one is an emulation of Thames. There's another one that's the Holland theme. There's a uh, eco theme. But the only reason anybody is in the Thames town, no one can afford the housing, no one wants to live there, but it turns out it's a great place for your wedding photographs. And so that's um, what keeps it from being a ghost city. But the dramatic difference between the very wealthy and everybody else uh, is cloaked by statistics that tell you what the per capita income is. Um, the wealth discrepancies that we looked at in the first lecture distort our impression of uh, the, what is the mean income, which is much lower than the average income. Uh, the pictures of traffic jams in China distorts the reality where only 10% of the people have access to a car. What happens as that increases, what is going to happen next? And is the property bubble going to burst first? Um, so I'm going to end it with that. And because um, we're out of time, I think. Oh, no, we're not out of time. So questions? I should have taken <laughs> more breaths. Um, yes? When you're talking about New York, you said the, um, the wealthy white people move Non um, but real estate is more expensive than everything is. Why is that the case? Now? Throughout history, short answer is yes. And the best example is the Heron Club back in Amsterdam uh, that we'll look at uh, in a future course. The Heron Club is a great example of this question that is still with us today. It was built for the wealthiest people of Dutch society during uh, the 16th and 17th century. And uh, real estate uh, historians, economic historians, have looked at the land values of the Herrenkraft, and they stay really stable. Um, those of us who own real estate are very happy about owning real estate because in the much shorter historical perspective, Real estate is the best game in town. It's always going to go up, and it's never going to not go up until 2007. And China is about to make uh, even a more dramatic splash in that department. Cities, over the long course of history, yes, are the most valued and uh, highest priced place to live. The United States, because of its um, exceptional, dramatic, uh, dramatically different means and measures that were taken after, especially after World War II, just prior to and just after, with the creation of the suburban landscape, with the interstate highway system, with the, uh, the subsidies of mortgages for white people um, that only changed uh, in 1965 with the Civil Rights Act, and even then there were other ways to achieve the same thing. Uh, the school systems in North America and the United States are funded in a totally different way than elsewhere. And many studies have looked at what are the contributions of each of these factors. 
to the aberration that is the United States real estate uh, market, where uh, for this short blip of history, wealthy people with choice chose to move out of the cities. And these factors were able to reverse the typical uh, progression of historical forces. In some cases, and I have to be very careful how I state this, some cities are now turning that around. Some cities are more attractive than the suburbs that surround them. Other cities, it's still the same. And if you look in aggregate in North America, even though we see uh, people getting all excited, oh look, people are moving back to the city. Empty nesters who thought they would retire in Florida are now moving back and they're buying small studio apartments in Manhattan to be close to medical care, their children, uh, and Lincoln Center, uh, and mass transit because they can't drive forever and we're living longer. And so uh, there has been some startling reversal of what we thought was the uh, inevitable trend here in the United States of moving out of cities and some people are moving back. But in aggregate, it hasn't changed. Uh, if you look at all cities in North America, the trend is still outward. Um, but we have yet to see what happens to uh, those of you who uh, are not so in debt with student loans that you're actually able to participate in uh, the real estate market when you graduate. And we'll see what you guys do. I mean, you're constantly surprising us with your, I don't need a car, uh, very strange choices, um, which I'm all in favor of. I've never owned a car myself. But... Um, it's just a little unsettling to have you guys. I don't know what to, I don't know what to do. It's great. Um, does that answer it? It probably raises more questions than it answers. Um, the, um, one of my favorite topics is how the American dream has left home and gone off on its own and has spread throughout the world to Myanmar, to China, to Indonesia, uh, to Latin America. And it has uh, taken on a life of its own that has, it has, bears some resemblance to the American dream as it manifested in North America. But in other ways, it is off the leash, has got its own trajectory, and it's manifesting in multiple ways that you could not predict simply by understanding the history of North American <coughs> Uh, projection of the American dream and what, what changes it's making. In North America, there's still a, a huge investment in the status symbols, um, even if the car is now the exception. The, the competition for status uh, is, is more or less on track. Uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, it's, it's, an open, it's an open field. Uh, it could go anywhere. But um, the evidence of um, real estate, uh, especially, uh, I was just living in South America where the real estate uh, market seems to favor very progressive modernist contemporary design, not, and it's all about exemplification, and there's very little reproduce with difference. Whereas in India, China, Indonesia, where I've spent years looking at this stuff, it is all about reproduce with difference, and you see uh, new towns and real estate, which are really real estate developments uh, that are themed, and they say Beverly Hills, or uh, Orange County, uh, or they make direct reference to Western enclaves of wealth and privilege. There is a uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, being built in China. Uh, where the designers went to Greenwich, Connecticut, and they measured and photographed things, and they, they're really trying to make a direct photocopy of Greenwich, Connecticut in China, uh, with slight adaptations to uh, Chinese uh, cultural preferences. Uh, but it's a very strange moment uh, in all of this. Okay, I think that's...